A tiny detail can be the key to solving the crime. The sum of small details leading to the main clue. Little things. But there's nothing more important than little things in an investigation. The most notorious felonies of the past. I will tell you how decades ago, criminologists sent criminals behind bars without relying on special equipment, surveillance cameras, and electronic databases. What an investigation was like when the most intricate crimes were solved only with the help of intuition and obtained physical evidence. Evidence. Larissa, I'm going to the classroom. Are you coming? Look, if I do this, you will lose your soccer ball to me. Okay, just go. Let's go. Sedokov, what's going on? I want you in class now. Foreman, get to the class. And you, beauty. Okay. What do we have here? To my dear pen friend. I can't wait to meet you. Well, my dear, don't you think at your age it's too early to think about boys? Give me your school journal. Faster. Give it to me. Well, are you done with all of the homework? Almost. What do you mean, almost? Well, I need to finish up with physics. I see. <gasps> are you texting him again? Larissa, don't even think about it. If you're out of the deal, stay and wait for your bus. The start of a school year in the mining town of Miyasinsk was overshadowed by a disturbing event. A 10th grade student, Larissa Levchenko, did not return home after school. The girl's classmate, Svetlana Verevkina, said that Larissa did not want to wait for the bus and got into an unknown person's blue, as she said, Lada car. Svetlana was not sure about the car model. She could never tell one make from another. The girl did not remember the car plate either, nor could she see the person behind the wheel. Svetlana did notice one detail, however, a strong smell of frankincense coming from the car. Three days passed since Larissa Levchenko disappeared. During this time, the Miyusinsk police questioned all the owners of blue Lada cars of any model. The same was done also in neighboring towns Shnezhnoye, Zayeznoye, Knyegivka, Krustalny, and Andrivka. However, the search operations yielded no results. None of the interviewed owners of blue Lada cars drove that day along the road the schoolgirls were walking. Traffic police officers stopped buses, short and long-haul trucks. No one could remember the Blue Lada. Let me in! I need to talk to the police chief. No admission! No admission to who? Let me in now! Where is my child? Three days have passed. For three days, my girl has been missing. Are you even looking for her? 
The parents' nerves were on edge. Uh, why? The Levchenkos broke into the office of the chief of the district police department, demanding whatever action. In a small town, the disappearance of a 15-year-old girl caused a huge response. Every resident understood this could well happen to their family. Neighbors and friends supported the parents as much as they could. Please calm down and tell me everything in detail. People still well remembered the nightmare of a decade ago, when the so-called Voroshilovgrad strangler was operating in the neighborhood. He raped and killed three girls. The local community were bitterly frustrated with the inaction of the police. Local residents went on spreading rumors about a new maniac out there in the city. I'm sorry, what? What maniac? I'm telling you, the maniac showed up again. The girl was raped and strangled. Oh, come on. So it was, and the body was buried in the forest. You always make something up. Yeah, you. Well, my dear. The Miusinsk Police Department received a directive to solve the crime as soon as possible. To help it happen, an experienced investigator, Special Agent Peter Mityaev from Voroshilovgrad, was put on the case. He used to be part of the team solving the case of that Voroshilovgrad strangler, Zavan Almazyan, nicknamed Steel Fingers. The investigator's track record also included solving a murder and the rape case of the nine year old Yelena Zakotnova in the town of Shakhti in the neighboring Rostov region. On the day of her disappearance, she went out with a friend to a bus stop. She got into the car and drove off. No one saw her after that. After reviewing the case, Peter Mityaev realized that the clues were way too few. It was impossible to check out all hundreds of the blue lotta cars in the nearby areas. But the witness could barely see the suspect and therefore was unable to offer a meaningful description. A smell of frankincense was the only thing to build on. Mityaev decided to work out this version in detail. There was only one church in the city. Mityaev went there. Good afternoon, Detective Mityaev. Good afternoon. What brings you here? We're investigating the missing girl. She was kidnapped in a car that smelled of frankincense. But why are you here and not at a sect? What sect? We have a sect settling down in the city. A conversation with the priest of a small church turned out to be very useful. The clergyman complained on the sectarians who were luring parishioners away. The priest was especially annoyed by the fact that the new religious community was not going to obey the laws and the decree on religious associations. Sectarians did not register and, according to the priest, behaved contrary to Christian principles. There's only one faith, Orthodox. And look, look at what they're doing. What about frankincense? I get frankincense directly from the monastery. Mm -hmm. And the sect guys are vending here, and there, they do whatever they want. Can you tell me where they are based? Parishioners say they congregate at 17 Pervomaiskaya Street. Mityaev checked the information received from the priest. It was confirmed a small but active unregistered sect operated in Mayusinsk. The girl could have become its victim. The 70s saw a considerable growth of religious activity observed everywhere. For the first time in many years, young people became interested in religion. On the European territory of the Soviet Union, especially in Ukraine, Moldova and the Baltic states, there were hundreds of registered communities of the so-called non-traditional churches. The number of unregistered ones could not be counted. The government, officially propagating atheism, fought with religious sentiments and with new churches whose activities were considered illegal. Authorities tried to kick them out of large cities. Thus, new pastors recruited flocks in small towns, creating innumerable communities. Good afternoon. Hello, good man. I see you aren't here to look for God, are you? The rector of the local church said that you conduct unauthorized rites and all sorts of meetings here. 
You see, there are no parishioners. We do not profess or preach. We do not conduct rites. Peter Mityaev was very surprised with that pastor's degree of awareness. But what struck him most was his hands. On his hands, he saw tattoos that could only mean one thing. The pastor had served a sentence. Why don't you tell me about these telltale images on your hands? Larion Afanasyev, former convict, former prisoner, convicted under Article 120, got out of jail last March. The conversation with the ex-con revealed that this man had done an eight-year term. The files of the Ministry of Internal Affairs listed Afanasyev among pedophiles and rapists. At that time, Article 120, inmate relations with a person under the puberty age, charging Afanasyev contained a wording the judicial system repeatedly stumbled over. The so-called age of consent was not defined in the Soviet Union. At the same time, the 1960 Criminal Code determined the punishment for intimacy with a person who has not reached puberty. This vague language created a number of problems. The achievement of puberty could only be established by a medical examination which no one cared to perform. On top of that, rural girls matured early and often sought to quickly leave for the city as soon as they could, in order to get married there. By this token, those who did not have the malicious intent to enter into relations with minors sometimes fell under Article 120. No one investigated it. I was sentenced to the maximum term of eight years. Yes, it's sad. I want to examine your premises. Please, go ahead. We have nothing to hide. As the saying goes, no fence will keep a burglar off. A good person has nothing to hide. Who cares about locks? What do you have here? Church utensils. You can check them out. All papers are just fine. We keep nothing illegal, nothing obscene. What is it? Oh, this? My lady and I. We collect herbs. We make extracts. Essential oils. Making essential oils at home was not uncommon. Foresters and healers, and just villagers who lived far away from dusty cities, would collect herbs in the woods to make extracts. They handed them over to pharmaceutical and cosmetic factories, where these extracts were used to make ointments and creams, tinctures and infusions, flavored soaps. The investigator asked where Afanasyev was on the day when the high school student disappeared. I was here all day long. There was a church service. Can someone confirm it? More than 20 people can. Will you share their addresses and names? No, sir. They will tell you the addresses and surnames only if they deem it necessary. I have no right to. Okay, we'll talk about this later. Although this community was not registered, most of the pastor's parishioners agreed to officially confirm his alibi. Yet again, the chance was missed, but one clue remained. The smell in the car. Mityaev intensively searched for any trifle that could lead him to a suspect. The investigator worked through all possible options that could explain the origin of frankincense. Mityaev took textbooks on herbs and plants in a local library. Well? Well, will your rattle trap ever start? A few minutes. We can go. Let's go. What's that smell? What smells? 
I was driving a bunch of bums to the bullpen. They fouled. They dirtied the whole car. No, not that. Where does the smell of frankincense come from? I bought a car odorant from a friend. He makes them himself. Let's go see him. Returning from school, 10th grader Larissa Levchenko got into a passing car, and no one has seen the girl ever since. Larissa's girlfriend did not remember the driver, but she said that the smell of frankincense was coming from inside the car. The parents demand an urgent investigation. The search for frankincense led the investigation to a craftsman who makes car odorants. Car air fresheners were shipped to the Soviet Union from Europe via the Baltic republics. People liked the overseas know-how. The pleasant odor was a special treat for Soviet car passengers, normally having to breathe with the smell of diesel fuel, gasoline and burnt rubber. At first, taxi drivers introduced the fashion for air fresheners. Then, more and more, happy motorists pick up the trend. The novelty was very scarce, but there were underground craftsmen who used to make their own air fresheners using essential oils. Vladimir Kalugin had worked as a seafarer with the Baltic Shipping Company for a long time traveling to all major ports in Europe and seeing many interesting things. Then he retired to lead a settled family life. To make his living, Kalugin went on producing primitive and easy-to-make air fresheners for cars. The demand for them was high. And one time, a neighbor bought a whole box from me. A box? Yes. Mityaev was lucky. A batch of odorants was sold to a man from a neighboring street. Semyon put up his blue Lada car for sale, and to get rid of the cabbage smell, permeating his car after years of transporting cabbage to the market, he bought a dozen air fresheners. The old man said that his car was bought by Vadim Kurnosenko, and he presented all the documents confirming the transaction. Semyon noted that the buyer really liked the smell in the car, and the old man gave him all the smells for a bottle of booze. Vadim Kurnosenko lived in the neighboring regional center Krasny Luch. He did not hide from anyone and volunteered to come to testify. However, the rumor about finding a man whose car gave a lift to Larissa quickly spread throughout the city. An enraged crowd gathered by the police station ready to lynch Kurnosenko. Here he is! Here he is! Come out! Where is my daughter? Murderer! Here he is! Where did you take the child? Where is my daughter? So what's going on here? Calm down! The investigation will figure everything out. Oh, we know how you will figure it out. Vadim Kurnosenko calmly and confidently testified. He did not deny that he gave a lift to Larissa Levchenko, but he claimed that he dropped the girl off at her request near the monument to the airplane, as locals called it. The airplane monument in the park of the city of Krasny Luch is a memorial to the pilots who died during World War II. It was opened on May 9, 1975, in honor of the 30th anniversary of the victory. This is the body of the MiG-19 jet fighter. Commemorative plaques list the names of the fallen pilots and aviators who died during the defense and liberation of the city. Inside Kurnosenko's car, they found a hairpin. Look! Folks, here it is! Here it is! Now you won't walk away. I just found it in your car. What is it? It's my daughter's hairpin. Kurnosenko was sincerely surprised by the find and suggested that the girl could have dropped it during the trip. No blood, no torn hair, no signs of a struggle were found in the car. The hairpin found inside the Lada proved only one thing. The girl was in the car, but Kurnosenko never denied it. 
Panic reigned in the city. People were afraid to go out. They did not let their children out of the house. The regional police department made a decision to augment the patrolling of the streets. Local TV showed a portrait of the missing girl. Mom! Mom! Yes? Look! Suddenly, Petya Lyamzin, a fifth grader, turned up at a police station. Petya Lyamzin attended the young photographer class at a local pioneer's house. During a school trip, he photographed the airplane monument. Good job. This, this is the girl they showed on TV yesterday. A girl resembling Larissa Levchenko accidentally got into the lens of Petya's camera. Do you recognize your daughter in this picture? Larissa? Larissa. Well, it's kind of far off. I I'm not very sure. Okay, there is a larger picture. She looks like her. Well, the clothes are very similar. Is this your daughter, Larissa? Yes. Thank you. I won't keep you any longer. I will call you. A picture taken by a young photographer lifted all suspicions from Kurnosenko. Kurnosenko, come out! I told you, but you didn't believe. Excuse me, but it's my job not to believe. The last time Larissa was seen was near the airplane monument. Mityaev decided to rake through the forest at a range of several kilometers around. In the forest, investigators found the ashes of what used to be a school journal. Peter, come quickly! A part of the cover with Larissa Levchenko's full name survived. A stack of burnt letters was also found. The finds were immediately sent for examination. On the surviving cover of Larissa Levchenko's school journal, experts found fingerprints. First of all, they checked the files of pedophiles and rapists. It didn't yield any results. Then the entire archive was carefully examined across the board. Mityaev and a team of experts spent several sleepless nights checking fingerprints. And finally they discovered a match. They belonged to a 53-year-old Efim Drobilin, previously convicted under Article 214 for parasitism, malicious evasion from fulfilling an employment requirement. Drobilin, it turns out, lived and worked as a janitor exactly at the Glory Park where the monument to the airplane was located. In the 70s, a variety of people fell under Article 214, parasitism. It was at that time that the generation of janitors and watchmen sprouted out. These were the people unwilling to abide by nine to five working days. Folks holding these jobs were free of reporting their arrivals to and departures from their workplaces. And such freedom attracted many from poets to ex-cons. Ironically, low wages were an additional advantage. Because of their low income, janitors and watchmen were entitled to basement apartments, closets, and even rooms in communal apartments. In short, live as you like and work at least one hour a day. Investigator Mityaev, you're under arrest. Take him. Not far from Drobilin's place of residence, an assistant investigator found a blood-stained blouse. When examining the clothes, Mityaev noticed that the sleeves were torn. One button was also missing. Everything indicated that the victim's clothes were violently torn off. Returning from school, 10th grader Larissa Levchenko got into a car passing by. Since then, no one has seen the girl. The investigation arrests the driver. The mother of the missing girl finds her daughter's hairpin 
pin in the Lada. A photo of Larissa appears on air of local TV. A young photographer recognizes her. It turns out that the 10th grader accidentally made it to the lens of his camera. Obviously, she got out of the car unharmed. While searching the forest, the investigators found Larissa's burned school journal. The main suspect became the local park's groundskeeper. Distinguished members of the court, I would like to point out that Yefem Drobilin's prints were found on Larissa Levchinko's journal. Drobilin explained the appearance of his fingerprints on the journal of a missing schoolgirl by a simple coincidence. Like he discovered a fire starting to flame in the forest, and to contain it, he snatched a journal from the flame and covered everything with soil. Drobian's explanations were logical, but the suspect was unable to give a reason why Larissa Levchenko's blood-stained blouse was found near his house. A blood-stained blouse found near Drobian's house became groundbreaking material evidence in the case of Larissa Levchenko's disappearance. The court sentenced Drobian to an exceptional measure of punishment. The court finds Yefim Drobilin guilty. Investigator Mityaev, however, did not feel that the case was closed. He was under too much pressure to transfer the case to court. He did not want to repeat the story of a year ago when the defendant also admitted his guilt. It happened in the city of Shakhti, Rostov region, where a second-grade schoolgirl, Elena Zakotnova, disappeared. The brutal murder, coupled with sexual violence, caused a wave of indignation. Police chiefs demanded immediate reports of solving the case. On the same day, Alexander Kravchenko, previously sentenced to 10 years for murder and rape, was detained. In prison, Kravchenko's cellmate would brutally beat him and force him to confess to the murder of Zakotnova. Kravchenko was sentenced to death for murdering the girl, and sometime later it became clear that it had been a wrongful accusation. Mityaev was a member of the investigation team in the Kravchenko case and was well aware of how Drobian's confession was obtained. The investigator understood that, as in the case of Kravchenko, pressure from relatives in Larissa Levchenko's case also played a certain role, and circumstantial evidence compensated for the lack of direct evidence. Mityaev could not afford Ford making the same mistake again. He decided to check everything thoroughly once more. The bloodstained blouse found at Drobian's house no longer offered a chance to find the girl alive, but it did not directly prove the guilt of the suspect. The first thing Mityaev did was to study the remains of the burnt letters. The surviving stamps suggested that these letters were sent from the Estonian city of Narva. No legible information about the addressee could be traced on the envelopes. Mityaev spoke to Svetlana again. Best friends shared everything, and she knew about the correspondence with an Estonian guy named Johannes. Do you have his contacts? How can I reach him? Oh, no, unfortunately. I don't know his number or address, but I can only say one thing. Larissa loved him very much. She was even ready to run away. I see. Uh... But how did they meet in the first place? Oh, a couple of years ago, with the help of an AgeMate magazine. AgeMate was a Soviet youth magazine published since 1962. The only printed media that covered the life and culture of foreign youth was supervised by the Soviet Young Communist League. AgeMate was the most popular magazine among Soviet boys and girls. One of the readers' favorite was the classified section where one could find a pen pal from any corner of their vast homeland. I found you. 
Johannes. Mityaev sent an official query to Johannes's parents, and a week later, in response, he received a package with a thick bundle of letters. It was Larissa's correspondence. The investigator immersed himself in reading. From the letters, Mityaev learned about the constant beatings and tyranny of Larissa's father. Where have you been? Hmm? At, at, at school. What school were you at? Look at me. Look at the clock. Dad! What school were you at? In this school? Any communication with boys was under a special ban for Larissa. One day, her father found an unfinished letter from Larissa to Johannes, which said that she really wanted to run away with him. The punishment was severe. The father threw Larissa into the cellar and locked her there without water, food, and light for two days. The mother did not interfere, believing that the father had the right to do so. In her last letter, the girl wrote that her tutor had dishonored her in front of the whole class for kissing a boy. But the worst thing for the 10th grader was an entry in her journal demanding her parents' response. Mityaev already knew how her parents could react. Larissa most likely burned the journal herself. Without a moment of delay, Mityaev went to the school to talk with Larissa Levchenko's class tutor. She perfectly remembered the incident with the kiss. She did make a note in her journal. But then it seemed to her that this was not enough, and she personally called Larissa's father at work and talked about how his daughter inappropriately behaved at school. The father promised to have a serious talk with his daughter. Mityaev understood what this serious conversation could lead to, and so did Larissa. Perhaps the girl simply ran away from home. Mityaev did not know this yet. He needed to talk to her parents again. Nikolai Levchenko's testimony stunned Mityaev. A strong, domineering man, unlike his calm and cold-blooded wife, messed up his testimony, jerking from one point to another, and appeared conspicuously nervous. First, he did not remember any call from school. Then he recalled something, but did not attach any importance to it. Once she made up that I put her in the basement for two days. Yes. But this is not true. Do you imagine this? Nikolai Levchenko's behavior was far from matching Larissa's father's profile, she described in her letters. Recorded by psychologists, multiple cases of girls lying about violence, as a rule, occur in families with conservative views. In cases where parents particularly zealously watch their daughter's innocence, protect her from communicating with young men. The girl may develop fantasies on a subconscious level. The house becomes a kind of castle in which they put the princess. Parents are the dragon that guards her while the boy is a prince charming who must free her from captivity. Johannes could become such a prince for Larissa. Gregory, were you generally satisfied with Nikolai as your employee? Well, yes, a hard-working leader. Always excellent performance. We issue bonuses to him every time. And leaving his references aside, what is he like in life? A little bit nervous, unbalanced. Once, Larissa's class teacher called, so he left his workplace without permission and ran away totally mad. What do you think you're doing? Mityaev could not understand why Nikolai Levchenko had lied about the call. The answer was hidden in this photo and a hairpin. Mityaev returned to the photograph taken by the schoolboy. He carefully, through a magnifying glass, studied all the details. And he did it. He saw the hairpin in Larissa's hair.
hairpin. Her hair is pinned up. Mityaev was stunned by the discovery, and in the photo, a hairpin was undoubtedly visible in Larissa Levchenko's hair. This detail baffled the whole thing. How did the evidence end up in Kurnosenko's car if the photo was taken after he dropped the girl off? Mityaev decided to talk to the girl's parents one more time. This time, he was very attentive to their reactions to the questions. The investigator was very surprised with how cold-bloodedly Larissa's mother behaved, which suspiciously contrasted with Nikolay's obvious nervousness. You know, we are having a hell of a puzzle over this hairpin. One boy took a picture of the airplane monument, and your daughter happened to be in the frame. And she had a hairpin in her hair. Peter Alexandrovich, look what I found. The pattern made it possible to assume that this was the same missing button from Larissa's blood-stained sweater. The investigator noticed how nervous Galina became. Her eyes darted around. She constantly glanced at the cellar door. I think we have something to talk about. Peter, take a look. Witnesses, you saw everything. This small, nondescript little thing, imperceptible at first glance, helped solve the case. Nikolai and Galina Levchenko no longer had any reason to play this game. They were interrogated separately, and Nikolai was the first to testify. Larissa Levchenko did not lie in her letters to Johannes. Ah, where is your school journal? I forgot it at school. Why are you lying to me? Your teacher called me. What did you do? Stop! Where are you going? To the police. Kolya, what police are you talking about? They won't help her anymore. You need to be rescued. Don't be sitting like a frozen idol. Help me. Where is my daughter? Look! Folks, here it is! Here it is! It's my daughter's hairpin! 
And everything could have worked out for her, even back at Kurnosenko's interrogation stage. But the perpetrators ended up being brought to light by a mere chance. A photograph taken by a fifth grade schoolboy played a hallmark role in solving the case of the missing 10th grader. Nikolai Levchenko was sentenced to 10 years for premeditated murder committed in a heavy state of mental agitation. Galina Levchenko ended up with 10 years for complicity, hiding evidence of crimes and giving false testimony. This was the end of the case of Larissa Levchenko's disappearance.